Good day, Dale. Thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. You're welcome. I have a little background to uh, present to our listeners and viewers today before we start with the questioning here. Uh, Dale Brethauer is Professor Emeritus of Psychology at Western Michigan University, and he's earned degrees from the University of Kansas, from Harvard, and the University of Michigan. He has taught at the University of Michigan, Cleveland State University, Western Michigan University, and Boise State University. He's been a reviewer for several professional journals, is widely published, and back before retirement, he presented regularly at professional conferences. He has served on advisory boards for the Institute for Rational Living, Ronagen Research and Development, and the Academic Skills Center, as well as he's been on the boards of directors of the North Central Reading Association and on the board of ISPI, the International Society for Performance Improvement. He is a past president of both ISPI and the National Cent North Center Reading Association. One of the pioneers of HPT, Human Performance Technology, Dale has been a consultant for more than 35 years. The Organizational Behavior Management Network recognizes his contributions with an Outstanding Contribution Award, and he has received ISPI's highest award, Honorary Member for Life. Again, Dale, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me, and one of my goals was to learn more about you in your in your early days. So I know that you grew up in Kansas. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, growing up in Kansas and uh, where you lived and uh, how you eventually made your way to the University of Kansas? Yes. I grew up on a farm in western Kansas, 760 acres, mostly pasture land. We raised cattle, raised a garden, raised chickens, lived off that. Um, I went to school in a one-room schoolhouse for the first two years of schooling, then moved and went into the great big city of Bird City, Kansas, where I finished, went through the third grade through high school at Bird City Rural High School. Graduated from there and the principal of the high school nominated me for the Summerfield Scholarship at the University of Kansas. And that was a great thing because we didn't have money to send Dale to college. But the Summerfield Scholarship paid me the princely sum of $90 a month. And from that $90 a month, I paid for tuition, board, incidentals, food, everything. My entire undergraduate education cost me about 3300 bucks, And that was in part because I could do arithmetic, and KU had a clever way of charging tuition. If you took 12 hours, they charged you full tuition. Any hours you took beyond that in a semester were free. I figured out that if I took 22 hours a semester, I could graduate in three years. I did that, and I graduated in three years, and I studied a lot. At that time, I didn't know much about learning, so I had to memorize a lot of things. But some really good things happened at KU. The, my very first psychology course was taught by a guy named Jack Michael, and Jack was teaching his very first psychology course and lecturing from B.F. Skinner's Science and Human Behavior. And by the end of that semester, Jack was hooked on behaviorism. I wasn't because I didn't know anything at all about anything at all, so I wanted to find out what else was out there. So I spent another couple of years trying to find out what else was out there, and when I did, I said to Jack, I want to do some more reading, so I took reading courses from him, and then applied to graduate school uh, to go to Harvard to study with B.F. Skinner, because that's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to learn more of that stuff 
that Jack had lectured about in that very in that very first course. So between the science and human behavior from Jack and the Summerfield scholarship from KU, I went went uh, I, I I got to KU, and from there I was able to get to Harvard. Partly because I studied a lot and had fairly high marks. I went to I went to Harvard with a National Science Foundation fellowship. I earned the Woodrow Wilson, but Harvard said you can't come to Woodrow Wilson with the Woodrow Wilson because everybody and his dog with the Woodrow Wilson wants to come to Harvard, and we don't want we can't take them all. So you can come to Harvard, but you can't do it as a Woodrow Wilson fellow. So I said, fine, I'll do it as a National Science Foundation fellow. And I did. And that was that was a nice thing because that was re, uh, renewable and I, I, I paid for the rest of my studies at Harvard with the National Science Foundation. I may have picked up a wood, uh, National Institutes of Mental Health fellowship along the way somewhere. Don't know for sure. But that was great because I could study them with Skitter. And I studied. Harvard was great because there were all sorts of very impressive people around there. Skinner was the one I knew in advance. S.S. Uh, Stevens was a psychologist who was there, who had been, like Skinner, a Harvard Junior Fellow when they were Harvard undergrads. And people uh, like Percy Bridgman would come by, or Norbert Wiener would come by, or people that I would read about and say, wow, these are hot shots. I better go to hear their colloquium. So there was a lot of additional education along, along the way. And I left there without uh, getting my PhD. I got a master's degree when I left. And I left there to go out to the University of Michigan to do a foreign language self-instructional project. Because Harvard had the teaching machine project going at that time. And there was a lot of talk about self-instructional things. And there was a little bit of work on self-instruction in languages. So I went out uh, to work with a guy named Harlan Lane and a guy named F. Rand Morton who had a project doing self-instructional programming in Chinese, Russian, French, Spanish, and Thai. And the, the main one was the Spanish program, but I ended up writing the Thai program. I told everybody program instruction works, and all you have to do is know something about about behavior, and you can make it work. And they said, "Okay, smart guy," because we lost our Thai guy to the Peace Corps, because there are not many guys that speak Thai and English. So the Peace Corps took Professor Gedney away from us. So Professor Gedney left us with a couple of very bright Thai graduate students and me, and they did all the recordings and. I told them what to say, and we developed that particular self-instructing program. So I was convinced by the time that it was over that I hadn't been lying to people, that really, if you knew about behavior and you were willing to listen to people who spoke the language, you could develop self-instructional material. So that, what else went on? That was, oh, then, out at the University of Michigan it was also a great place because George Geis, who many of us know, was at the Center for Research on Learning and Teaching. Harlan Lane, who had lured me out there in the first place, was at the Center for Research on Language and Language Behavior. Uh, Morton and Lane had started an institute 
and the institute started doing workshops in how to write program instruction. It was a week-long workshop, and they needed a text for it. So I ended up writing my first book, which was a self-instructional text in, in principles and practices of program instruction or some such title. And it was a pretty good program, except that it was just theory and talk. And But it was good enough theory and talk so that somebody could read the theory and talk, understand it well enough to try to write self-instructional programs. And we had some very smart editors around that would help them convert their first drafts into final drafts and into a decent um, programmed instruction exercise. And we also uh, knew that part of the process had to be, they had to know how to developmentally test their programs. So Thursday night, uh, Gary, who was heading the workshops, hired a bunch of undergraduates to come in and type like mad all night and type the first drafts of their programs so that Friday morning they could test them, and they brought in test subjects. Now, we discovered right away that what the participants did on Thursday night was go out in, on the town in Ann Arbor, and they ate a lot, and they drank a lot, and they came in hung over on Friday, and were in no shape to test their programs. So Gary fixed that. He had them stay on Thursday night, and I lectured to them. I told them all about behavior analysis and how to influence behavior and how to shape behavior, and told them marvelous stories of, about shaping the behavior of chemistry professors, which students at Harvard did and, and I have participated in. So I told them lots of stories about behavior change, about shaping behavior. So they could work on Friday, and then we did a clever thing, which was after they went out into the world with their programs, we called them on the phone and said, how's it going? What's worked? What hasn't worked? And they would tell us that, and we could feed that information back into our workshops. So we had that external feedback loop that we desperately needed in order to make it the, the workshop work well. And they also told us stories, and they said, hey, you know that, that lecture Dale did on Thursday night? I used some of that, uh, and this is how I shaped my boss to do a better job of interviewing people. Or, uh, so they started feeding us stories. So somebody, it was probably Karen Brethauer, who was my wife in, during those years, uh, said, why don't we make a three-day applied behavior analysis training program, and people will come into it, and we'll teach them all that stuff. So that is how that one got started. Uh, we soon changed the name to Management Behavior Change. But So we had people out there then doing, doing what's now called OBM, and, and HPT, and a variety of things. But at that time, it was just going out there and changing some behavior. We also started following up with some of the people who graduated from the training, uh, from the program learning workshop, and discovered uh, that there were some things that needed to be done to support the behavior that they trained in the workshops. So out of that came a, a week-long workshop called the Training Systems Workshop. And that showed all of these things that people had to do to support performance, real performance in real organizations. And that particular course that we, we taught for several years became the basis for Geary's consulting pro, pro, uh, uh, program, consulting uh, firm later on. So is this is so is that uh, where you created what you call the ter total performance system and Gary called the general systems model? Precisely. Ah. Uh, 
Karen wrote a paper called The Neglected Half of Behavior Change Maintenance, the Behavior Neglected Half. And so we drew that diagram to show that once they had learned something, they were going to be in an environment that was going to determine whether they used it or not and how well they used it and all that sort of stuff. So we started using that diagram in both the uh, management of behavior change course and the, the training systems workshop. That was really the core of the training systems workshop. Every time you got a, a, a piece of an organization, draw a picture of it using that diagram. And once you got that done, you can understand some of the things you have to do to make that little system work. Uh, a friend of mine, former doctoral student, calls that little piece of work the total performance system on a napkin. Mm -hmm. Because in his consulting practice, he always draws it out on a napkin. And he says, if you can figure out how to label this napkin, you can figure out the strategy you need for your to make your organization work. And so they, they have fun making the rest of the labels on the napkin. So, Very interesting. Anyways. I remember in the late 90s asking Gary, well, how come Dale calls it the total performance system and you call it the general systems model, but basically it's the same thing, I think, is it? And he said, yes, it was. He said, well, which one of you invented it? And he said, well, you were sitting in a conference room and you invented it together, but you were holding the pen uh, at the flip chart easel, drawing it out when it, when it was created. So he always credited you with the visual that, uh, that yeah. everybody sees. Well, and I also published before Gary did. Uh -huh. I validated that diagram as my doctoral dissertation in 1970. Mm -hmm. The classroom as a self-modifying system was the name of that doctoral dissertation. And it showed that you could use that diagram to figure out the variables that you need, the feedback you needed to present to everybody in the classroom so that the classroom functioned well. And we had a, a, a fifth grade classroom, a third grade classroom, a university classroom, a resource center, and an elementary school all working as self-modifying systems. And we had, <laughs> we had lots of data in that dissertation that validated the total performance system diagram. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of work to, to validate that, so I'm glad Gary gave me credit for holding the flip chart and doing other great stuff. George Oldman also deserves a lot of credit for that diagram. Mm -hmm. Because George used to tell us, you behaviorists know how to change any behavior in organizations, but you don't have a clue about what behavior to change. And so when we started working with the total performance system, Oliorn said, now you have a clue. So it was a very important thing in my life, and it helped us all learn a lot, I think. Well, thank you. Can I take you back to your time at Harvard, and you mentioned the uh, Teaching Machine Project. Were you involved in that effort? I was a little bit. Uh, I wanted to learn how to write programs, so I developed a program on some mathematical topic and validated it. Uh, I also... Uh, just sort of hung around the place, talked a lot with Jim Holland, who was running the the lab in which they they had programmed science and human behavior, and uh, Skinner taught an undergraduate course using that program as the text. Uh, Skinner still lectured, but he didn't have to. He just lectured because that's what you do at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And the people learned the stuff from the from the program that Jim Holland had written and validated. So I was really involved in understanding that you have to collect data, you have to revise 
You have to developmentally test. You have to validate. You have to collect data every step of the way to do program instruction properly. And that was that was a, a very key learning uh, at Harvard. I learned a whole bunch of stuff from SS Stevens about measurement and things that I, I treasure to this very day. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. So how did you go from, or what was the uh, progression from the University of Michigan to Western Michigan? Can you fill in the, my, my gap of knowledge about that? Yeah, I had a, a friend who went uh, from Michigan down to Cleveland State University, and he said, hey, you, you like general systems theory? You know James G. Miller, who wrote the, that big, thick book on, on general systems theory that you carry around and refer to all the time? Well, he's the number two guy down here. So why don't you come down here and be part of the psychology department and get to know it. So that was an offer I couldn't refuse. So I accepted the job at Cleveland State University in the psychology department. By the time I got there, James G. Miller was no longer the number two guy at Cleveland State. He was the number one guy at some other university. So I didn't, I didn't get to work with him. But I did get to work with some other very bright people there. We started in a thing called the Center for Effective Learning, which worked with faculty at Cleveland State to improve the quality of their instruction. We also worked with the faculties of, what, 10 other universities around the state. And we had, at Cleveland State, we had a master's degree program in clinical psychology and a master's degree program in school psychology. And I worked in both of those programs and gained enough knowledge and experience to qualify for a, a license as a clinical psychologist, which was how I finally got the license for as a clinical psychologist. But we we had well we were involved in the in the training and certification of all of the school psychologists in the in the state of Ohio. Ohio is kind of unique in that to get psychological services, you have to flunk out. You have to, the, the school system has to say, we cannot serve this student in our regular classrooms. They have to go into our special ed classrooms. And so they boot them out of the regular mainstream into the side stream uh, that included school psychology. And what we trained our school psychologists to do was how, was get those people back into the mainstream. Naturally, we would do that because we were that kind of folks. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so then how did you get to uh, Western Michigan? I got a call from a, a friend of mine uh, who was uh, Dick Malott. And Malott had uh, some really talented graduate students who could do cartoons. And they had taken my total performance system work and made a book, a cartoon book out of it. So that uh, I, it, that cartoon book became well known. I got a letter one time from the president of the International Tooth Fairy Society. And she said her son had been home from school and had a, a something in a brown wrapper that he kept reading and giggling about. So she looked, what is this thing? And it was a book, he insisted. It was a textbook, he insisted. And it turned out it was. It was a textbook and a course he was taking from Tom Mawinney at, at, at Indiana. And so... It was a real book and a real textbook. So they, she happened to be the president of the International Tooth Fairy Society. So she sent me a, a letter of a, a commendation, which is still in my file somewhere. Anyway, Dick and I had that, that background. 
and he, he said the, the psych department is almost totally behavioral now. We have one man left in organizational psychology, but he's about to retire. We want you to come up and give a colloquium, and then we'll see if we offer you a job here to take that position. So I did. I came up there and I gave a colloquium in the middle of an awful snowstorm. And after that colloquium, they offered me the job. And I took the job, even though it meant disrupting my family, picking up my son, who was a junior in high school, moving him from, from school in Cleveland Heights and in, into school uh, in Kalamazoo. But we, we did all that. And I, so I, I joined the faculty. The, the man retired. I learned after I got there that my colleagues hoped that I would decide to kill the organizational psych program. Because then they could say, oh, we need Dale, he's qualified in clinical. Oh, we need, we get Dale, he's qualified in school, we can add to our program. They thought that would be really great. But I thought, no, by gosh, there are jobs out there in the organizational psych that our students could fill. So I'll see if that's true. And if it is, we'll keep this thing going. So we did. We had to keep it going. We had to admit a lot of students into the program. So we did. Then we had to educate them. So we did. Then we had to get really good at educating them. So we did. And that enabled us to get that program going. And some of the students who were in that program did little consulting work around the town and around the university. And some of the students then started the Organizational Behavior Management Network. The uh, principal for that was Alice Dickinson, who was presented at ISPI a number of times and is now a full professor at Western Michigan University. So, but she did most of the work in starting the Organizational Behavior Management Network, and it grew from nothing to a, I think it is now larger than ISPI, but I'm not positive of that. And it'll be only true if ISPI has shrunk, and I think it, ISPI has shrunk. But I, I just love the Organizational Behavior Management Network because the, the people in that network understand that we have to have principles of behavior, we have to have a science of behavior, we have to collect data, we have to let the data guide us as we do our work. So they understand human performance technology better than people who don't have that background. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're going out and doing wonderful things. One of the things they did in 2001 is to publish a handbook for that area of interest. And the thing they're doing is coming here is with publishing the second edition of that handbook. Excellent. It's a going concern. I love it. Can you talk to me a little bit about uh, learning to learn? I, I learned about this, not very well, from you 15 years ago or more, back probably in 99 when you were the president of ISPI, and I was on your board, and I heard you talk about this, and I've been intrigued. Um, but for our audience, can you can you share with us a little bit about your involvement in the Learning to Learn program, what it is, how that works, some of the uh, key points? Yeah, thank you for asking about that. When, when I was uh, at Michigan, one of my jobs was being chief of the Reading Improvement Service. And the Reading Improvement Service was intended to help people read well enough so that they could learn the content of their courses at the University of Michigan. And those courses are fairly challenging. Uh, the University of Michigan at that time had a very well-deserved reputation. So we had a, a course in speed reading and at the same time, 
we wanted to make sure that they could read and comprehend their textbooks. Now, the key to, uh, to reading and comprehending an, an academic textbook is to understand that that textbook is a set of answers to a, to a bunch of questions. You don't know what the questions are, but your prof does, and your prof is going to ask you those questions on exams. And if you can answer those questions on exams, then you comprehend the textbooks. And if you know the questions in advance, which you can, if you study the textbook and say, what question is this answering? And if you generate about 100 questions for each one of your courses, you will ace your courses. So that was, that was the nub of it. And it worked almost that slick. Uh, we, we started that. A friend of mine who was a grad student at the same time, Marcia Hyman, made her career out of learning to learn and uh, teaching learning to learn in elementary and secondary schools. And after I went back down to Cleveland State and up again to Western Michigan again, they let me teach a course called Human Learning. And what I taught in that course was the learning to learn process. And one of the, one of the students in that course was a young woman named Kimberly Morrill. Kimberly Morrill was in there because her mother, Carolyn Smalley, my wife, said, Kimberly, if you take Dale's course in learning, I'll pay your tuition. <laughs> Kimberly said, what a deal. So she took the course. And Kimberly is a very bright woman, caught on very quickly to that business about asking questions and then coming up with good answers to them and organizing your learning around asking and answering questions. So she took that course, took a follow-on course, uh, tutored in learning to learn, and then decided that was so much fun she would take all the other courses that they all taught, which she did, and she earned her master's degree in organizational psych in that program. Went from there to work with Gary Rumler in Tucson for a number of years before she left and went, went east where she now lives in Maryland. Yes. Interesting. Very interesting. All right. Yeah. Get, let's shift gears here a little bit to uh, talk about your books. Um, I've got the titles of three books that I'm going to like to ask you about, and you have eight other books that you published over, over the years here, but... Uh, Talk to us a little bit about the performance-based instruction linking training to business results book that you wrote with your mm -hmm. wife, Carolyn Smalley. Okay, terrific. That, that was, that was a, an interesting book to write because uh, most training is not very closely focused on performance. You don't start out by going out and analyzing some performance and then analyzing what knowledge and skills have to be acquired in order to perform that way. So we thought, I thought, that we should have a book that showed people how to do that because I had, a, I had been teaching a course in training and development for years that took that approach. Carolyn who was a training manager at Amway, said that's the, that's the approach to take. She took it, grew her department, had enormous success doing that. So what happened was we decided to go ahead and write the book, and we wanted a book that could be read by people in the training field. So I wrote a bunch of stuff. Carolyn said this will not work. Uh, she said, simplify, 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 clarify, clarify, clarify. So we did, and out came that book, uh, which I am I am very proud of. Yes, excellent book. Thank you. Uh, what about your, uh, this, this book, The Transformation? What, uh, you co-authored that. Can you tell us a little bit about your co-author and what that book is all about? Yeah, the co-author is a guy named Doug LeFleur, and Doug 
was one of the first people I actually recruited to try to bring in to the doctoral program at Western. And the reason that I tried to recruit him was that he, he was a businessman. He came to see me one day uh, for, because somebody had told him that I was worth talking to and he couldn't figure out what, why in the world that would be. But he came to talk to me and said, Here, here's what I do. I run a, a company and what we do is reline chimneys. Chimneys burn wood. Wood has tar in it. It tars up the inside of chimneys. If you don't clean that out periodically, you burn your house down. So my business is relining chimneys. And we have a process that my dad brought over from England for relining stuff. But my dad's about to retire, and I'm about to take over the business if I can, and I don't know how to do it. So is there anything you can do to help, asked Doug. And I said, yeah, the second meeting of my behavioral systems analysis class meets in two hours. Be there. <laughs> that, that class was the first of a two-part series, and it uses Tom Gilbert's human competence as the textbook. If you're going to have going to have people relining chimneys, they better be competent. And they better put linings in that don't burn down houses and stuff like that. So it was Competence was just the thing that he that Doug needed. So Doug took the, that systems course. He reorganized his, his core, his dad's business, made it more profitable. And Doug decided, well, he would continue that in the program and get a doctorate and continue doing consulting work, which he did. But he, he, he said to me one day, Dale, that process of taking over my dad's company, learning how to do it, learning how to apply behavioral systems concepts to that business was a, an intriguing process. We should tell the world about that. So we decided, and, and Doug wrote the book and was kind enough to allow me to do a little bit of editing and a lot of complaining and so on. Uh, and it, it's basically Doug's book. And it's a lovely, lovely book. It's a, it's a fairly quick read. I don't know if it's still in print, but it's a great little book. I think I saw it on Amazon earlier today. So uh, it, it's probably available uh, one way or another, used or new. I'm not sure. Um, your This third book I wanted to ask you about... Uh, um, performance analysis, knowing what to do and how. Mm -hmm. You had a co-author with that, if I understand what I saw online today, was, or is that your book? That, was, that one is my book, but in a way, Roger Kaufman is a co-author. Okay. He part of a series that he was editing, and it's also uh, one of the, sort of an, an outgroup of the Tucson 7 group. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Tucson 7 Group never decided to write a book together, which some of us wanted to do, and some of us didn't want to do that, and then Gary died, and that didn't happen. The, the, uh, that performance book is an attempt to, in a very straightforward, readable, simple English language to, do, to show people what the total performance system is about, what general system theory is about, and how to apply that uh, to analyzing performance and real performance in real organizations. And I think it's a pretty good book. I don't know how well it's done, because I haven't asked Roger for royalties or anything. Maybe I should do that. <laughs> well, uh, I, it Thank you for that segue back to uh, one of the topics on my list here. And I, and I spoke with Roger Kaufman just earlier today about this. So I wanted to talk about the Tucson 7. And my backstory about this is I was, I can't remember if this was in 2002, 3, or 4, but I was 
either going to become the president-elect of ISPI or I was going to become the president. I can't remember exactly. But Roger Addison came and asked me to join him. And he also asked Tim Eskew to join us. And we attended the very first meeting of what eventually became known as the Tucson 7. And I was, I was there, I guess, because of my leadership role that I was going to get into. And I was going to listen to a bunch of you complain about how the society was not meeting your needs or something. That's my takeaway here all these years later. And it was decided that the, the, that the meeting would continue and that everybody would meet at Gary's place, uh, Gary Rummer's place in Tucson. And so everybody made their arrangements and checked their calendars and picked a date and all of that. And I went back to my offices back in Chicago and I I made uh, my flight reservation, a hotel reservation, and then Roger Addison called me and disinvited me. And he told me that that I was disinvited, Tim Eskew was in, disinvited, and that he was disinvited <laughs> from this meeting. And so the seven of you were going to meet, <coughs> excuse me, this was uh, uh, you and Gary Rumler and Danny Langdon, Roger Kaufman, Don Toasty, Claude Lineberry, and Bob Carlton. Yeah. And uh, I would imagine Joe Harless would have been there, but he'd already retired uh, and uh, was no longer coming to any of the uh, society uh, conferences. But uh, what, I, what I heard afterwards, because I was trying to pay attention to this, because I wanted to help uh, meet your needs because you represented uh, what I would have called the old guard and you, know, you weren't getting anything new. You, the ISPI conferences wasn't doing anything for you as I understood one of the issues. And uh, so you guys went off and you spent most of your time sharing with each other what you did, how you did it, your methods and, uh, and tools and techniques, etc. And you guys decided that you were, uh, weren't going to start a new society, which I guess was on the table at one point. Uh, and uh, so... You didn't. You weren't a breakaway group, although I think many of us feared that you were going to become a breakaway group uh, because uh, ISPI was no longer meeting your needs and other issues. Now, I won't say what Roger said in the video interview I did with him earlier today, but uh, so what I was hoping you could do for us is talk to us a little bit about your recollection of what the Tucson 7 was all about what the issues uh, that they had were, what you wanted the society to do about those issues, um, and your takeaway from the whole experience and whether or not anything uh, happened uh, that was uh, uh, positive in terms of addressing uh, the issues that the seven of you had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me turn it over to you. <laughs> okay, you you have given the background very well. I didn't know that bit about you and Addison and Ask, but it, 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 it sort of rings true because what, what we wanted to, to be in, in the early going was a group of people who had been with the society for at least about 30 years, which meant youngsters like you guys just didn't mm -hmm. qualify. Roger Addison probably did, actually, and you almost did, and, but Tim certainly did. And so anyway, we, we wanted to get together because we had discovered that most of our learning at ISBI conferences occurred when two or three or four of us got together at a bar and talked to one another. So we said, well, why go to ISBI and go to a bar to do that? Why not go to Geary's house? Because he has a very nice house, a nice facility there, and we can go there and talk. So that, that is what we did. Uh, Geary <laughs> in, really introduced uh, us to the idea that why the reason he had called the beating at his house was he wanted to learn from people sitting around the table. And he had, he knew quite a bit about what each of us did, had gone to presentations we had done, but 
uh, I think at that time I was the only one he had actually worked with. He hadn't worked with the others, so he wanted to be able to have some quality time in which we could dig down in depth into projects that we had done, ask one another questions, why did you do that, why didn't you do this other thing, and learn from one another. So that's what we did, and that was fun. I don't remember whether we did a round robin uh, or whether, I, I think we had at each meeting somebody who was supposed to lead it off by presenting something. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that's true, but it's likely <laughs> that it's true. And so we would then just sort of go from there, because everyone in that group is really good at asking questions, and really good at asking tough questions, and really good at not letting people squirm and, and BS around the answers. And in that group, none of us were inclined to let anybody else even attempt to BS. So we thought it would be a, a good learning group. And I think it was. I, I think it was. I learned more about uh, Kaufman's thinking on, on MEGA. I learned more about why Geary did not incorporate uh, Kaufman's thinking on MEGA into his work. And it was simply because Geary's an engineer. And unless he can draw you a step-by-step -step procedure for incorporating it, telling you who should come to the meeting, what they should do, what they're, you know, all that detail mm -hmm. of project implementation. Until he knew how to do that, he didn't feel comfortable in charging clients for talking about MEGA. Kaufman, on the other hand, probably had all of that intuitively in his back pocket, but never had it out of his back pocket onto paper. And we, uh, over time, I think I pulled some of it out of his back pocket mm -hmm. and to focus early on what are what are what is your strategy for your organization? Well, I can tell you that you have the same strategy that every other business organization in the entire world has. Would you like to know what your strategy is? What your purpose is? Yes, they would. Your purpose, whatever your product or service, your purpose is making a better world for tomorrow's child. And they would mull that over and, well, I don't want to make a worse world for tomorrow's child. Well, if making my widget, if I could make my widgets and sell them and make a better world for at least a few of tomorrow's children, I would like that. So that would start the conversation in a good and healthy and constructive direction. So and I think probably Kaufman is a master at doing that and has tricks in his back pocket for getting companies to move on uh, that I still don't have and, and that Gary never had and I don't suppose any of the rest of us did. But <clears throat> one of the one of my hopes, if the if the uh, Tucson Seven had continued, is that we we would be able to do at least a detailed understanding of one another's approach, know and and figure out that the differences were largely in our tar target markets. Because I I know there were differences there. I know that. That, that Danny worked with different folks than, than uh, Butch and Bob did. Mm -hmm. So I, I just know it worked out that way. I know that you, for example, worked with engineers most of the time. Gary did also, I think. Mm -hmm. so I worked with, uh, with people in the public sector a lot because I knew that world and could get down to the nitty-gritty in that world fairly quickly. But, so anyway, the Tucson 7 eventually died a natural death uh, when Gary died. We never, all of us were, all of us loved ISPI. None of us were thinking we knew how to serve ISPI. 
because most people at ISBI didn't know why they were coming to our sessions, except somebody had told them we were good old boys, and they should, but they would look bewildered during most of it. So we didn't think we were reaching the ISBI audience as well as we would like to. But we never solved the problem of how can we serve ISBI better and how can we enable ISBI to serve us better. I've heard you speak about this before, and I know that you have a love for ABBA and the OBM. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about they as an organization, and you talked a little about, about the OBM uh, uh, network. Um, and I think that you kind of gravitated towards them uh, at the end of your career before you really retired. I'm not sure uh, when you really retired, but um, can you talk to us a little bit about the, what's the value proposition as you see it for ABBA and OBM? You talked a little bit about that earlier, right? Okay. Everything we do, I think, is about identifying the variables that influence performance. And the, the people in OBM and that network understand the really close-in variables, the immediate things uh, that influence. They understand why sales training has to include a lot of practice and, and being happily rejected. Uh, uh, so very, we understand that a lot of performance management has to be about putting yourself under the control of whoever's performance you're managing. You can't manage them unless you're willing to respond to their actual performance, their actual things they do, the actual things they feel and think and so on. So you have to walk a mile in their shoes, to put it simply. <laughs> now, the people in, in ABBA who have worked with uh, elementary school children understand that very well. What the people in ABBA don't understand is that business is good. Business is not about making money, as many of them thought and think. But business is about serving customers. Business is about, as Roger would say, making a better world for tomorrow's child. That's what we're all trying to do. And the, the people in ABBA understand that better, I think, than the, than the people in ISPI. Another thing that I really like is that ISPI applies what we do to its own functioning. One of, one of, one of the, uh, the doctoral students that I advised, doctoral dissertation was the ISBI conference in a box, making a, whole, a full set of job aids so that somebody could run the conference. I don't know if it's still in use. I doubt it because it required too much attention to the audience, and I don't think the current I ISBI people pay as much attention to the audience as the, the, friend, the friends sitting around the table. I don't know that, but that's what I suspect. Anyway, the ISPI did doctoral dissertations about and used performance technology. One of my doctoral students, Maria Malat, I think she was the second of my doctoral students, uh, runs ISPI as a business uses the total performance system uh, as the basis for her analysis, you, knows how to expand the total performance system into Gary Rumler's performance system diagrams. So she knows the precise way of connecting Gary's stuff and my stuff. So there's just a lot of uh, material that, that is there in the International Association for Applied Behavior Analysis, that's not there in ISPI. And, and I'm afraid will not come back. One of the things that keeps 
I, <laughs> Abba going is Abba keeps growing new talent through the, the graduate programs that where the, the students from graduate programs feed into uh, the ISBI or the uh, ABBA conferences. They make presentations. There will be a hundred or so presentations at, uh, at ABBA by students. They do that as, as poster sessions. I could never get poster sessions to work at ISBI. Mm -hmm. Tried four or five years and gave it up. Mm -hmm. So there's that that youthful enthusiasm keeps coming into the society, and it keeps being guided by the technology. So I have great hopes for the the future of the OBM network and the International Society. Uh, for behavior analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of things to ask you about here before we wrap up. Uh, one of them is that uh, I would like your comment on an article that you wrote for the Performance and Improvement Journal. And the title of this is Yes, We Can, a rejoinder <laughs> to Don Winnicky's rejoinder about saving the world with HPT. Uh, Tell us a little bit about uh, how we can save the world with HPT, because I think that Don took the opposite view. Yeah, Don did take the opposite view, and part of the reason that Don took the op op opposite view was simply, we don't know how to do stuff. And I said, yes, Don, we do. And the yes, we can was based on a presentation I did at ISBI that listed, I don't know, maybe a, a hundred or so articles showing all of the things we could do with performance improvement principles. And they covered areas that Don said we don't know how to do. Mm -hmm. Now, Don wanted to control more of the group phenomena but, uh, and I didn't have time, uh, and I didn't have the reference to show him exactly how to do that. Because I always use group process technology in all of the courses that I taught, in all the graduate courses, nearly all of the undergraduate courses. And I learned that stuff in part from a guy named Frank Petrock. Frank Petrock, when he was 23 years old, was the warden of New Jersey's most maximum, maximum security unit. And he took the job because nobody else wanted it. Who wouldn't want to try to herd the worst of the worst? The way you got into that unit, if you were an inmate, was you flunked out of the pan, the major pan, then you flunk, got into the maximum security pen, then you flunked out of that into Frank Petrock's unit. And Frank Petrock wanted to use groups to win the thing. Now, th 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 these people's idea of a group was somebody does what I tell them or I pound them. And if I can't pound them, they can, they'll try to pound me in a thing. Whoever pounds the other one is going to win. And that was sort of true with their life experience. So Frank had to find a way of turning that around. And so he used performance technology in that maximum security unit uh, to give them opportunities to learn how to improve. And then he said, if you ever want to get out of this place, you've got to vote some of your people out. And if you're going to vote people out, you've got to vote people out in such a way that I, the warden, agree with. So you've got to learn how to do those things. So Frank just ran a tight ship in which he used the principles of performance improvement to get people so that they could run groups, so that they could run the prison, so that they could get themselves out of this wonderful place into 
a, another maximum security prison which they, from which they can get paroled to the outside world. Mm -hmm. so, but if I had that technology at the time, and I could have included that in, in the Yes We Can story. Mm -hmm. I, I want to ask you about, uh, I think, one of your most famous quotes. And uh, Roger Coffin actually uh, quoted you uh, earlier today on this. If you are, and I'm paraphrasing it because I'm not, I didn't look it up to see what the actual quote was, but if you aren't adding value, you are likely subtracting value. I, I think it's on its face, it's pretty obvious, but talk to us a little bit about uh, about your writing of that and uh, uh, where, what you were getting at. Yeah, yeah, and I haven't been able to find the paper in which I first wrote about that. But the, the thought comes from every behavior has a cost. And it's right out of Tom Gilbert's book. Everything we do has a cost. Some of what we do adds value. If we can do more adding value and less adding simply cost, we're going to be better off. So it's one of the things that I had to do. The, when I took over as chief of the Reading Improvement Service at Michigan, I asked Don Smith, what, what am I responsible for, Don? And Don said, Dale, you're responsible for everything. <laughs> I said, Don, that's not fair. Um, I don't do everything. And Don said, if anything good happens, you give credit for it. If anything bad happens, you take responsibility. You are responsible for everything. If the things you do don't add value, a lot of costly behaviors are going to occur and the place is not going to function. So that was part of my learning to be a manager, was learning you can't afford to add cost. You've got to be adding value. And that, uh, that means a lot for the things you can say, do, and model for people. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's a great backstory on that. My final question, um, uh, my final ask is, what words of wisdom do you have for people who are entering the field of performance improvement? What are your suggestions? What guidance do you have? I, I would say read a lot and read, among other things, uh, read this book that I'm now holding up, uh, which is the closer. That's closer. good. Yes, I see it. Handbook of Organizational Performance, Behavior Analysis, and Management. Yeah, that's one of the good books to read. Uh, uh, go online and Google Maria Malott, M-A-L-O-T-T. -T. And the reason you, she has one of the best books and as a sort of an introduction to the total performance system, she wrote it first in Spanish, so it's the English translation of the Spanish book, but it's quite a good book. Uh, read anything that Maria has written over the years. Uh, she's very, very good. But, but I think, oh, read a lot and imagine that <clears throat> there's a thing you should do. And that is, as you're reading something, say to yourself, where's the data? And if you can find the data, read some more. And if you can't, close the book. But the, unless what you're reading is very closely connected to data, it's not a high priority for your reading and learning. Well, thank you very much for that guidance. Dale, again, thank you so much for all that you've done for the movement, 
performance improvement movement, if you will, uh, for NSPI back in the early days, for ISPI later on. Um, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, chatting with you today. And uh, uh, again, thank you so much. Have a great day. You too, Guy. It's been instructive to me to think about some of these things. What did we actually do during those days? And to remember that the training system, the workshop, was what led to a lot of Gary's books and technology and so on. So I was delighted to do the exercise guide. Thank you. You're a master at this work. Thank you so much, Dale. Have a great day. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.